What we have is, at the moment, of course, is we have a credit crisis. We have a crisis of credit. We've had free money for decades now, and of course the debts are unrepayable. Basically, everyone is in default. The banks are in default, countries are in default, so, uh, the banks are insolvent, the central banks are insolvent. Now, when you say who actually controls it, are we actually looking for a family like the Rothschilds, who are certainly in there somewhere, the oligarchs who then buy, so you have G Jeff Bezos who owns the, the uh, Washington Post. You have um, uh, Bill Gates who owns the Guardian newspaper here, which isn't a particularly good newspaper or popular newspaper, but it feeds straight into national broadcasting. If they're going to run anything today and every morning, it's the Guardian they read, and so they set the agenda. It's very difficult to find out actually who controls everything. So the even in the Daily Telegraph, supposed to be an independent newspaper, you find that uh, Bill Gates is controlling their medical pages. He's controlling their uh, all sorts of other pages. Um, and so the control, you, you, have, you have a view, let's say, you have a, an ethos of world government. They want world government. They want to centralize world government. And there are enough of them to actually control the mainstream media. And I would argue that the biggest defense that we have in a free society is a free press. We haven't had a free press for years. Uh, and I think the sacking of Tucker Carlson just proved that beyond almost any, exactly. any doubt. No, it goes uh, but the BBC yeah. has been uh, a government statement. And if it comes to foreign policy, for example, you can actually see British journalists on BBC. You can see their eyes flicker along the prompt screen reading the CIA press release. Welcome to my show. My name is Kivan Davani. I have the honor and pleasure to have Mr. Godfrey Bloom on my show for the first time. Um, let me just uh, turn off the YouTube so we don't have an echo. Um, Godfrey, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll make it short because I know you're under pretty much time pressure today. Uh, perhaps we can, you know, uh, follow up on on our uh, some of the topics I really want to talk to you about in the future. Welcome to the show, Godfrey. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you very much. A pleasure to be on your show. Godfrey, uh, I um, uh, read your book, uh, by the way, <laughs> just shortly, a couple of days ago. Uh, really impressed. Um, and um, I mean, I do know I do know you. I've, I've listened to some of your speeches. You know, it's like so many years ago. Uh, and as you know yourself, it went like super viral. I guess tens of millions of people already watched it. It was uh, uh, in the European Parliament, uh, your speeches about central banks and how broke they are and, you know, the whole uh, cesspool of, of corruption and fraud. What I want to talk to you about in essence uh, today is um, because my listeners and, uh, and followers, I mean, they, they are pretty familiar, you know, because it's a Bitcoin uh, focused uh, podcast about money and inflation and, you know, the systemic problems with the monetary financial structure. And I know from your curriculum vita, I'm going to put all the, you know, uh, your your resume, your curriculum vita, your website uh, down below in um, on my podcast uh, on the sh on the show notes. Um, since you also worked in the city of London, um, what I'm a little bit curious about is if you can share. I mean, if you if you do if you if you do have insights about like to get like sort of a broader comprehensive understanding, a bigger picture of the control structures, monetary financial control structures, whether we're talking about City of London, Bank of International Settlements, the central banks in general, uh, the banks um, and fiat money, fiat, the fiat monetary system and everything, all the sim symptoms and tentacles that come out of it, whether it be systemic theft, systemic corruption, systemic criminality, that's been going on right now. I mean, it's in plain sight. Uh, can you share, I mean, your opinion, your your overview, uh, so what people might, you know, get a sense of it, like who controls whom? I mean, we could also talk about the crown, you know, the legacy of the crown, how much, how much land they control all over the world. Um, I know it's like millions and millions of square kilometers. <laughs> But I've never like I mean I've I've been deep into the rabbit hole I've 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 read like books you know the creature of Gr Jekyll Island by Griffin or Eustache Mullins the Secrets of Federal Reserve I've you know studied books about the Bank of International Settlements 
You know where I'm going with this, Godfrey. So what is the bigger picture? Well, I think um, the problem that we have uh, is the removal of the concept of hard money. And if I, that, that's where it all starts. Okay? This is where it actually starts. So let's say we go back. Uh, we don't want to sort of go back too far in history because that, then it just eats into time. Uh, although <laughs> I'm always happy to do that if there is time, which sadly there never is. But for example, if you go back to the Napoleonic Wars, uh, and which finished uh, at the Battle of Waterloo in uh, 1815, uh, we then return to the gold standard. Uh, we come off the gold standard in order to pay for the war, as everybody does. Uh, if you want to pay for a war in, in, in historical terms, you come off the gold standard. Uh, and this is something that Henry VIII did for his, his war. Uh, he added alloy or clipped coins, so on and so forth. Uh, he was followed, of course, by Queen Elizabeth I, uh, who then tried to restore the concept of hard money, and in came Thomas Gresham, her chancellor, whose course famous uh, quotation is, bad money drives out good. Uh, Gresham Street is still there. Uh, the Bank of England uh, came into fruition over a relatively slow period of time and was not a state-sponsored bank uh, as it is today. Uh, so uh, when we went back onto the gold standard, uh, uh, after the Napoleonic War, uh, we then stayed on the gold standard until 1914, of course, when the Great War, as we refer to it in Britain, is called the Great War. Uh, and it's interesting that the staple diet, the price of a loaf of bread, was the same in 1816 as it was in 1913. So nearly 100 years, we didn't have inflation because you can't inflate gold money. There are other dynamics involved in that, like the repeal of the Corn Laws and so on and so forth. But I don't think I don't think we need to get uh, sidetracked by that. So if you have hard money, uh, you, it can't inflate. It's impossible to inflate it. Uh, and that doesn't matter whether you argue for gold or you argue for Bitcoin. Governments can't inflate it to pay for wars. And then, of course, we saw uh, we came off the gold standard in 1914. Uh, in order to pay for our wars and brought in something called the Bradbury Pound and various other things. Uh, we came off it again in during the recession and the depression in the 1930s. Uh, and uh, when we tried to restore the gold standard, we came back at the pre-war uh, the, the, uh, pre -war cost of gold, uh, which is was ridiculous. Uh, and people blamed returning to the gold standard. It was returning to the gold standard at the wrong price. That was the problem. Uh, anyway, we fast forward all that. Uh, and then, of course, we have the 1971 closing of the gold window by Nixon. Again, coming off the gold standard, surprise to price, for pay for another war, the war in Vietnam. Uh, and you have to come off, you have to inflate the currency or cheat the currency in order to pay for war. And of course, that causes inflation, that causes monetary inflation, which feeds through to price inflation. And that's exactly what we've seen now. And so we've seen. Uh, for example, uh, in gold, we've seen the degradation just since the turn of this century, which is only 23 years ago, um, the fall in the purchasing power of, uh, of the dollar against gold into the tune of something like 96%. It is quite astonishingly how degraded our currency has been. Uh, and of course, politicians have, uh, politicians had through their central bank uh, and this is not just true of Britain, of course, this is true of America, it's true of the, you know, the European Central Bank, it's true of the Japanese Central Bank. They have a machine that can print money. Uh, that's, that's the sim simplicity of it. Uh, it, it. It's a machine that uh, can print money. Now, even if we were a saint, even if I were a saint and you were a saint and you had that machine and said, I will never use it for bad purposes. I will only use it for the good of mankind. You sooner or later, you would be tempted and you would persuade yourself you were doing the good of mankind uh, because you needed a new car or your mother was ill or whatever it is. And of course, political co considerations. Now, to turn this money making machine over to politicians who are inherently sociopaths or criminals is madness. Of course, they print it and they print the money to pay for their friends, pay for their indexing pensions, uh, to pay for all the freebies, their mates and all the things that go with that uh, and their wars. 
constant wars, uh, and the, uh, the United States is the worst offender of the lot. They have been at war with somebody since uh, 1776, uh, the War of Independence, with everybody, for, with the exception of 16 years. They're at war with everybody all the time. They never stop. It's as militaristic in America today as the Prussians were in the late 1890s. It is a militaristic empire. Uh, and the only way you can do that uh, is uh, by printing money, uh, especially if you degrade your manufacturing base, which, of course, what the Americans have done, subcontracted their manufacturing base to the Far East, China. So you have all these things which are degrading money in, the, uh, in people's pockets. And, of course, then, of course, I'm sure your, uh, your uh, audience will be familiar with the concept of the Cantillon effect. Everybody is happy... Uh, at, at being, if you already have assets and they're inflated, so if you own great swathes of property or if you own precious metals or you own all these things and they go up in value, you're OK. But if you're at the back of the queue and Cantillon explained this, the French economy, worth looking up if any of your uh, audience or my audience have not looked this up. I'm sure they have because we both have slightly boutique audiences you know we're always slightly preaching to the choir on these things otherwise they wouldn't be uh, they wouldn't be following us uh, or they wouldn't be subscribers uh, so it, uh, that's always a problem because it's the 80 20 rule 80 percent of the people don't understand any of this which is why they're constantly caught out uh, and so there are people get a little bit entangled sometimes with the concept of the city of london uh, the City of London is governed under its uh, reg regulatory system uh, by um, a, an enabling act, uh, which is uh, done by Parliament. So it's actually done by Parliament. Um, so they have to follow the rules and regulations just the same way as that Wall Street has to follow the SEC and various other things, uh, uh, other regulatory bodies. Now, the problem is, of course, they're fake. The regulatory bodies are fake. Uh, what actually happens is it's self-regulation. And so it's run for the benefit of the people who are regulated. Uh, and it's just the same now when it comes to Big Pharma, the MHRA and all the rest of it. Uh, it's run. Big Pharma regulates itself. The World Health Organization um, regulates itself uh, by the oligarchs who are in Big Pharma and the health systems that benefit from it. So everything is fake. Uh, you know, and when people say, oh, it's been peer reviewed or this has been peer reviewed or that's been passed by the uh, uh, FDI or the MHRA or thing. No, it's fake. It's fake. Uh, and of course, unless you drill down and find out about it, you don't realize how fake it, fake it is. But we do have these quirks which are sometimes built up a little more than they need to be. For example, let's take the parliament. Let's take Black Rod. Since the time of, of rejecting Charles I's entry into Parliament now, Black Rod has to knock on the door in order to come in to Parliament to deliver what is known as the Queen's Speech, which will now be the King's Speech, of course. Mm -hmm. He has to knock. He cannot just come in. And there are the same protocols with the City of London. Uh, but they are nearly a thousand years old, and that is really part of the tradition. They don't mean anything in the... Or they don't mean a lot in, the, in real terms. Uh, it, it, isn't, it isn't an important factor because already the system is so corrupt, it doesn't matter. You know, you don't have to look back over a thousand years to a protocol uh, to actually enforce, the, um, uh, enforce these things. It's already there in spades. Uh, so this is the problem that we have. And of course, both here uh, in Great Britain and in North America, in, in the United States, you have a choice. You either vote red or you vote blue. Uh, it's it, it, it is a, it, it's and, and of course they all sing off the same hymn sheet. They are the same people. Exactly. The leader of the opposition, Keir yes. Starmer, here, and our prime minister, um, uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, who's a, an ex Goldman Sachs guy, who are all corrupt. I mean, Goldman Sachs is the fundamental definition of banking corruption. Yeah. Uh, and so this is one of the problems that we have, and they always end up in the in the seats of power, uh, and they are uh, World Economic Forum agents. Uh, so we now have a situation, for example, where our king, our new king, is a World Economic Forum agent. He's quite open about it. It's not a conspiracy theory. He yeah. is constantly on the Davos platform explaining how we are not entitled to make decisions anymore for our own lives. We're not capable of doing that. And he and his ilk at the WF have to make these decisions for us. We have a prime minister. We have a chancellor of the exchequer who's WEF. Uh, we have an archbishop of Canterbury 
the Archbishop of Canterbury is, is a self-confirmed uh, disciple, if I may use that word for him, a disciple of the World Economic Forum. Uh, and that kicks you into what is a secular society, what is the secular society, and how people will use certain things like uh, fake science is the main thing. Uh, it's all for our own benefit. We have to have all these injections. We have to have these experimental jobs for our own benefit. The world's going to boil if we drive our cars and all this kind of thing. 20% of us, 100% of your audience and 100% of my audience know this is fake. Right. But 80% of the people, you only need 80% of the population to go with you in a democracy. Yeah, and, <laughs> That's and all you just, need. Yeah. You and need the indoctrination is just, it's just too deep. The indoctrination and, you know, the superficiality and the brainwashing has been, I think, I mean, they've done a tremendous job, to be honest with you. I mean, uh, they've done really. But since you mentioned Prince Charles, I mean, I see him as sort of a symbol or representative of the crown. Um, and he's a puppet. But um, can I ask you that straightforward? Do you think Prince Charles is being extorted? Like, I mean, you know, uh, you know exactly where I'm going with this, uh, with all the child trafficking, pedophilia that's going on and uh, systematically. Uh, do you think Prince Charles is just another puppet who is being blackmailed? Is it just, or does he really have some, say, is that really his ideology to become, I don't know, more powerful or more, I don't know, to be more in control of um, of the great reset? <laughs> that's what they call it. If you asked me a question I've asked myself a million times. It's very difficult to know where some of these people are just incredibly gullible, stupid, ignorant, naive um, to go with this. It's extremely difficult. And I really can't make up my mind and people will have to make up their own mind. Um, but it goes the same with these people who have not been challenged. For example, uh, if you are the king of England, you have spent your entire life not being challenged surrounded by sycophants, uh, saying, yes, that was wonderful, yes, you're marvellous, so on and so forth. Uh, and so nobody says, just a minute, I listened, to your, uh, I listened to your speech on climate change, and it was so hopelessly full of technical holes, it was unbelievable. Your Majesty, you really ought to take some time out to actually learn your subject before you go on TV. <laughs> now, I was in a private hearing with uh, King Charles, the Prince of Wales, as he then was, when I was a member of the European Parliament. It was quite a small gathering, and he was giving one of these, you know, uh, talks on climate change and so on and so forth, and how the world was going to boil uh, in six years if we didn't all, you know, do what we've got to do and net zero and all the rest of it. And before we went in, we were told that under no circumstances could we interrupt, ask a question, from the floor, he was allowed to give his talk without any form of interruption whatsoever, and then depart. And the only way I could get back at this was to pack the front row with my friends and my researchers, because we couldn't ask questions and we couldn't interrupt. So every time he said something, the world's going to boil in six years, and all this kind of thing, we all roared with laughter. <laughs> it was our way of getting at him, and it certainly did disconcert him. Mm -hmm. And there's a clip, just literally a clip he made only um, less than a year ago. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, oh, you know, the world's going to boil. This is mine. And, and he said without any sense of irony, and I've been saying this now. I've been banging this drum for nearly 40 years. The world's with no sense of irony. And nobody's there saying, if you've been saying this for 40 years, when is it exactly going to happen? <laughs> When's it going to happen? You've just told us that for the last 40 years it hasn't happened, but it's going to happen. When is it you actually get off your soapbox and say, goodness me, I think I've made a mistake. <laughs> I've obviously got this wrong. Uh, yeah. so nobody's it has I mean, it goes back to the Club of Rome, you know, um, Malthusian, I, you know, agenda. I mean, yeah, I mean, my audience knows pretty much, but I think it's 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 still important. I think to somehow, yeah, uh, uh, review the 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 ideology and the agenda behind it. Um, you know what Prince Charles is just regurgitating. The king and his father were Malthusians. There's no question about that. Uh, they all believe, of course, and it was interesting. Even Her Majesty, uh, uh, just two years ago, when we were in the middle of the lockdown, the bits and pieces, she said. She said, um, we're going to have to change the way we do things. And of course, she didn't mean her. She <laughs> meant me <laughs> and my neighbours and my family, not her. These people never mean them. Unbelievable. So they continue 
continue to expand their family, have lots and lots of children, have lots of private aeroplanes, lots of cars, lots of palaces, lots of castles, they're not going to change the way they're going to do it. And when did you last see a political interviewer or any interviewer say, what personal sacrifices are you going to make, Your Majesty, yourself? How many palaces are you going to close? How many, how many aeroplanes are you going to discard? Are you going to start traveling around the globe uh, on ordinary uh, uh, scheduled hours? Nobody ever says that things. So he continues in this bubble of his own. So when you ask me, is he mad, naive, gullible, evil, stupid? The question is, so we don't really know. Um, I think it's probably a mixture of all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So um, you mentioned also the the, the central banks and um, okay. So you know we 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 always hear about the Rothschilds, but I think it, Rothschild is just one. I mean, they they are still very very powerful uh, puppet masters. Uh, with it's now ten or hundreds of trillions of you know of 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 wealth they control. Uh, what I'm interested in, I mean, uh, uh, you know, there's a tentacles, military industrial complex, uh, the corporate complex, the intelligence complex. Um, is there is there a picture you can draw where we can connect the dots? I mean, are there any like faceless entities or individuals, families that are controlling the central bank, even the Federal Reserve? The Federal Reserve, I mean, it's privately owned, as we know, right? Right. So who controls the Federal Reserve? Uh, do we have the faces, the, the owners, the names? No, we don't, right? No, we, do, we, we, we don't know. We only know the people who are really up front, don't we? We, knew, we know about George Soros. We know about Bill Gates. Uh, we know about Jeff Bezos. We know about all these people. But these are, these are just bureaucrats. These are just handlers. These are just, you know, operatives. I mean, they are rich and wealthy and, you know, in, in a way powerful. But uh, that's why the title of, of this episode is Who Controls the Money? the monetary fiat system, which is the central banking system? Well, let's have a look at, let's look at it from a slightly different angle. What we have is, at the moment, of course, is we have a credit crisis. We have a crisis of credit. We've had free money for decades now. And of course, the debts are unrepayable. Basically, everyone is in default. The banks are in default. Countries are in default. So, uh, the banks are insolvent. The central banks are insolvent. Now, when you say who actually controls it, are we actually looking for a family like the Rothschilds, who are certainly in there somewhere, the oligarchs who then buy, so you have G Jeff Bezos who owns the, the uh, Washington Post, you have um, uh, Bill Gates who owns the Guardian newspaper here, which isn't a particularly good newspaper or popular newspaper, but it feeds straight into national broadcasting. If they're going to run anything today and every morning, it's the Guardian they read, and so they set the agenda. It's very difficult to find out actually who controls everything. So the even in the Daily Telegraph, supposed to be an independent newspaper, you find that uh, Bill Gates is controlling their medical pages. He's controlling their uh, all sorts of other pages. Um, and so the control, you, you, have, you have a view, let's say, you have a, an ethos, of world government. They want world government. They want a centralized world government. And there are enough of them to actually control the mainstream media. And I would argue that the biggest defense that we have in a free society is a free press. We haven't had a free press for years. Uh, and I think the sacking of Tucker Carlson just proved that beyond almost any, exactly. any doubt. No, it goes uh, but the BBC yeah. has been uh, a government statement. And if it comes to foreign policy, for example, you can actually see British journalists on BBC. You can see their eyes flicker along the prompt screen reading the CIA press release. Yeah. You can actually yeah. see it. And yeah. I've been on it's television a, yeah. before. And, it's, TV, it's, and I, went across, I put yeah. my hand over it. I yeah. said, now, uh, no, look at me. Talk to me. Don't read the CIA press release. Uh, well, Syria in particular and various other things in the Middle East. And nobody's talking about Libya ever again. So it may be a little bit difficult to actually suggest who is individually running this. But when you've got a syndicate, uh, which includes the King of England, the Prime Minister of England, uh, uh, the, the Fed, the ECB, uh, world leaders who are openly boasted about by Carl Schwab that he's infiltrated cabinets all across the world, Australia, who does exactly what they're told, foreign policy with Great Britain, we do exactly what Washington tells us to do. Um, is there any one person or one family or, or one group? I think it's a sort of a, an, a, a, 
a, a globalist ethos, uh, which so many people of massive influence share, I'm not sure that you can pin it down to one person or of a number of persons like, dare I suggest something like Moriarty uh, from the from the, the, the Sherlock Holmes uh, who done it, uh, you know, one figure of evil. Right. I think I think that would be too simplistic. It's more nuanced, definitely. Yeah, it's more, a little bit more complex. But uh, I'm always, you know, being curious because you know the first time I understood that these institutions, entities, or you know, would it be the Bank of International Settlements and their members uh, and other, you know, institutions are not accountable, criminally immune. <laughs> and they're above the law. I mean, there's a, even a speech, not a speech, an interview with Alan Greenspan where he said, you know, who's above, like, like he was talking about the Federal Reserve, that there is nothing above the Federal Reserve. It makes its own, it's above the law. It is, you know, it was implying the Federal Reserve is above the law. And that, that shocked me for the first time to understand, you know, they are criminal immune. They are not, they are not, they are untouchable. And that's something where I'm like, okay, what's a cesspool of corruption and un unaccountability? I mean, even the justice system. Uh, I mean, there are lawyers, you know, who say in Germany, the, the justice system is lost. I mean, it's it's uh, they're either totally dependent or uh, they are being, I don't know, bribed, corrupted, uh, extorted, or just under control, you know? So there's no independent judiciary anymore. You know what I'm saying? This, these are the tentacles I, I was talking about. This is, the, the, yes, you're absolutely right. It's the same in Britain. Uh, since the era of Tony Blair, all senior judicial appointments are politicized. All senior civil service appointments are politicized. I spent a little time in the army myself uh, years ago, not with any great distinction, I have to add. Uh, but I can tell you, you cannot get above the rank of full colonel without being politically approved. Right. So you have wokery in the army. So uh, your generals have to pay lip service to uh, ludicrous things like the war in the Ukraine, uh, the, the uh, transgender in the army, pretending that isn't going to affect units' uh, ability, uh, the, the destruction of crown immunity when it came to uh, the army uh, justice system which was a very good justice system that's been taken out that's been deferred that's been put forward to the european court of human rights which is a totally political unit as you know i mean that's that's a political judiciary uh with relatively junior judges um uh, who uh, in our level of uh, judiciary here would be no but uh, higher than probably district judge or what we used to call a stipendary magistrate very junior these aren't the great legal minds of yesteryear that we used to have in this country. So we've degraded the principles of English law. We've degraded the English, uh, the education system. I have lectured to third year economics and history undergraduates at Cambridge, Oxford, Durham, some of the greatest oldest. And I can tell you that they know nothing about their entitlement under our constitution. They don't even think we have a constitution. They've never really heard about the 1688 Bill of Rights, the Tolerance Act, the Act of Settlement, uh, the principles of English law, you do not get an education uh, at a British university. You no. go to play rugby, have passes and drink beer. And that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. I love all of that myself. Uh, but now, if I lecture at Warsaw School of Economics, which I have done, you're dealing with people who can speak three languages, discuss all ex aspects of economics. And if you go for a drink with them, they can discuss Napoleon's campaigns in the peninsula. If you went to a Warsaw university, you're probably educated. If you went to... Uh, an English or American university, you're just dumb. Right. And, you know, I mean, the, the school system and educational system, is, it's a can of worm by itself. I mean, we could talk like, talk, like for hours, like, uh, uh, because, uh, you know, I mean, I went to a very, you know, very conservative, very, you know, elite school and then went to university, studied law. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there's lots of people like me. I'm like, after many decades, I'm like asking myself, what have I really learned? <laughs> have I really learned to question anything? Have I, uh, you know, have we learned anything about the, you know, about the taboo topics, you know, about money? Uh, we haven't learned anything, to be honest with you. It's just, you know, so you become an accepted member of society. That's that's all or this matrix, you know. So uh, the the five minutes we have, or four minutes or six minutes we have left, um, Okay, I know. I mean, it, it would just, it would just, it's just a compressed question. But uh, still, what would you say if we do achieve, um, um, whether we're talking about gold or Bitcoin, a transitional combination uh, between gold and Bitcoin? Um, 
permissionless, de truly decentralized, unconfiscatable, totally detached from the system. So we don't have to fight the system, as Buckminster Fuller said, you know, don't fight the system, create a new model, a new system in order to make the old one obsolete. What if we achieve this? Do you think um, we've, we've finally achieved this point where all these tentacles become by itself obsolete, the criminality, the, the, the systemic corruption, theft, you know? <laughs> Yes, I think uh, I think you've got a point. I think we need to detach ourselves from it. Uh, and we are, of course, there's a number of dynamics that we're looking at. We have Bitcoin, of course, uh, where people, the Bitcoin has understood that you need to get out of a state run uh, system. Of course you do. I've been a gold bug uh, for most of my, uh, well, most of my latter life, for the last 30 years. Anyway, I'm a gold bug. I do not buy this Bitcoin versus gold. I think that's fake. It's a fake yeah. argument. Uh, they're complementary. They right. both get us out of the state system. And I get annoyed when I get teenage Bitcoiners come on to me and say, oh, you don't know anything about Bitcoin. You don't understand Bitcoin. And, and, and you've got an ancient relic and it's an old piece of rock. This is just childish. We are both following the same goals. Because it's the same we properties. The same scarcity. Goals. We're talking about scarcity. I mean, uh, that's one common, I would say, one essential uh, commonality it's a scarcity, or let's say relative or absolute scarcity, right? Exactly. It doesn't matter particularly whether you believe in Bitcoin or whether you believe in gold. What we both believe in is that you don't want to be involved in the state system because they will rob you because they're criminals. Now, of course, the other dynamic, which is just coming on the stream, uh, is the BRICS nations that are taking the same view. This isn't just you and me and our subscribers and our, our friends and, and, and people who agree with us. We have the biggest block of people of population on the planet now, the BRICS, which outweigh number wise the West, uh, saying, no, we don't want this. They've weaponized the dollar. We don't trust the American system. We don't trust fiat currencies. We don't trust Western central banks. All of this, which we have brought on ourselves, they're saying we're going to have a new and we don't quite know how it's going to work yet. It, it's not. We don't quite know. But they're talking about having the one or the ruble or interchangeable. And it's going to be uh, and it's going to be in part gold backed. It looks like it's going to be gold backed because the central banks are buying gold. And that's your that's your giveaway. Now, where I believe that is going to change the dynamic, because it's going to mean there's a very easy way of getting yourself out of the system. Uh, you know, it's much easier because you can just there's no reason to stop you trading in, in, in one or rubles or a hard asset backed currency. You, you know, you can you can you can do that. Uh, and that's going to be a lot easier. Uh, and what I was hoping and it hasn't yet, it won't be a really big step forward for Bitcoin. And I have held Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I'm a I'm a believer in, in, in Bitcoin being a very good concept. But what we have to have is uh, an acceptance generally as money, uh, which is a medium of exchange. It has to be an internationally accepted medium of exchange. And I've had this sort of discussion before in, in, a, in a helpful and, and constructive way. I've been to most capitals in the world. That's not because I'm clever. It's because I'm old. Uh, I've been to sort of New York, Buenos Aires, Delhi, Zurich. I've been all over the world in my lifetime. I expect you've seen an awful lot of it too. I can go to any posh hotel in the world and I can tip the sov a, a sovereign, an English gold sovereign to mm -hmm. the concierge and get exactly what I like. Yeah, he yeah. will go away yeah. into the yeah. and make the only question sometimes I have to Godfrey is like, how do you assay the authenticity, the purity of gold? That's the thing because with Bitcoin, you know, you you, you I mean, it's in plain sight, it's in in real time, it's on the blockchain, and there it is, it's hundred percent proof. But with gold, it's like um, I, I don't know. Do I can I trust you? I mean, is this is this pure? Is this authentic? Is it really? Well, this is what I like about coin rather than bullion. Yeah. I like coin. Uh, because that's all really done, been done for you. Yes, you could fake the coins, but I uh, use Sharps Pixley in London. Mm -hmm. uh, and occasionally, if I want to cash a bar, I just go up the stairs. It takes a nanosecond for their machine to tell me that that's... Right, okay. Right, yeah. it, 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 it takes seconds. It takes seconds. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about the individual, like, you know, can you do it, like, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, like... Uh... <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. Uh, but we're talking, we're talking about people with a portfolio, people, you know, Middle England, the professional man. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, there's not much you can do to help people who don't have any money to start with. You know, they don't have anything to start with. So there's not much you can do. But if you're a professional man, I'm just an ordinary professional man in England with a small holding here in Yorkshire with a few chickens and a few horses and bits and pieces. <laughs> I'm just an ordinary middle middle guy. Yeah. Uh, and I can make gold work perfectly well for me. And, I, and I've got an account with Baird. I've got an account with Pure Gold. I've got an account with Sharps Pickley. I can pick the phone up. Uh, it's insured. It's safe stored. Not with a bank. Not with a bank, which mm -hmm. the government own and can bust into whenever they exactly. want. No, an independent yeah. safe deposit bank. I can phone them up and I say, I need to sell £50,000 worth of gold. They will transfer that money the next day. It's really very easy. Exactly. Uh, and so it, Bitcoin, uh, gold, it is actually easy. And, of course, we're now living in a situation where you try and get £50,000 out of your bank now. Go to your bank or £20,000 and ask you what you want it for. Oh, my God. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's not yours. It's not yours. It's an IOU. No, no exactly. but they can't do that if you have an independent gold account uh, with a reputable uh, people like Baird, Pure Gold. There's lots, and you know, there's quite right. a few in. Right. And on the spreads, just a very quick word about the spreads. Uh, for those of you who are interested, and I know Bitcoin is interested in gold, and gold bugs are interested in Bitcoin, because it's flip side of, of both what we believe in. Um, I've arranged with a... Uh, a, a bullion dealer in London, very reputable, that they will buy your gold back at spot. The guarantee they'll buy back at spot. So yes, you pay a 3% premium when you're buying your piece of gold or your gold coin. That's how they make their turn. That's legitimate business. I don't have an issue. Nobody should have an issue with that. Okay. But when you want to sell it back to them, they will give you spot price. That mm -hmm. means you're not taking a 3% hit on your sale. Mm -hmm. So you're only really dealing with a 3% bid. Well, that's the same as, that's smaller than a unit trust, an investment trust, or a stock or a bond. So it is a very sophisticated world. And as I say, the key is, if I had that gold, if I had that gold it's got to be recognised. It has to really be a Krugerrand or a Sovereign or something like that, that is instantly recognised as being yeah. so. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's certainly, yeah. your, your, your concierge or your hotel manager uh will will be very happy to take that especially in india believe me if you've got the nerve to take oh, yeah, gold india. Yeah. Into india. yeah there's a lot of so, so many it people is accepted yeah. money it is accepted it's an accepted medium of exchange mm. i'm looking forward to the day when bitcoin is too and i thought the breakthrough would come with Elon, Elon musk when he said i will sell you your your car for bitcoin transfer bitcoin and i'll sell you the car i was hoping every car dealer would do the same that would be an enormous breakthrough for bitcoin as a, yeah. a true medium of exchange it's going to happen and it's happening i mean on the second layer and the third layer i mean it's, it's super advanced right now it's it's uh, the, the pace of development but uh godfrey i know you you've, you're in the time pressure i'm going to let you go but uh, there's so many top topics i know you're a military expert also and uh you're also an economist i want to talk to you about hope about the essence and, and nature of the government the nation state whether it's relevant or irrelevant at all uh, but maybe we can follow up sometime, I don't know, maybe in a couple of months or whenever you have some time. That would be Absolutely. great. Absolutely. I'd, I'd love to if you if you email me or, or Patrick, who's my yes. uh, who's my techie guy. <clears throat> we picked up your email. It got lost in the bucket. <laughs> it's like so long time ago. I know. But, yeah. uh, yes, but yes, love to, I'd love to talk to you again. Uh, you know, let's book it in for six weeks time or something. Awesome. Thank you so much. And appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. Uh, so um, that was Godfrey Bloom, a legendary Austrian economist, uh, former member of uh, parliament and, and uh, author, uh, amazing, um, amazing man. Uh, I just wanted to just screen share. Let me just uh, put this uh, on screen share. Here you go. Uh, that's his website. Uh, that's godfreebloom.uk, where you can also read his um, resume or uh, curriculum vitae, all his articles, his publications, everything else. And then the last book I read is a pretty, you know, compact and short book, but uh, really amazing. The, the ban uh, it's, you know, for the layman or laywoman, the magic of banking, the common collapse. So that was a really, you know, fascinating, but dense uh, conversation with Godfrey Bloom. Uh, hope you you know, you could, uh, you were able to
take something out of it and uh, internalize it. Um, I was going to go deeper, you know, talk about Bitcoin, um, about his comprehension and, uh, and, you know, how he's, you know, sees the world in a hyper Bitcoinized world, how he sees it, you know, with uh, or in a goal, on a gold standard, what could, you know, the world look like. But uh, we'll see. Um, hopefully we'll have another follow up conversation in the next few months. My name is Kevin Davani. I'm the host of the Kevin Davani Connection Show. And let me know your thoughts, your questions and any other. Yeah. Any other ideas, inspirations for the uh, for the next um, chat? Thank you so much. And I'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks.